Hi, I'm Nina Bosky, and welcome to Life Bites, where each and every week we'll get you inspired in the areas of life, business, and media. We'll help you dare, dream, do, and be so you can get out of your head into your soul in order to tune in and take a bite. This week, we're getting you life inspired. Hi, everybody. My name is Nina Bosky, and welcome to Life Bites, Life Inspired. This guest that we have on the show today is a person that I have to say highly impacted me when I saw him speak at our Transformational Leaders Conference. And I think he's talking about one of the most important subjects today, historical empathy. And you may be asking yourself, what is historical empathy? Well, we're going to find out. But this man is an educator. He's been in the world of making a social impact in terms of research, taking people on the railroad tours. He's been a school board member. He helps our youth understand historical empathy. And he has about 20,000 artifacts of different cultures and ethnic backgrounds talking about this very, very important subject today. Because this world today needs empathy more than divide. So I am honored to bring him to the show today to share with us his insights and his historical background that we'll all get a chance to see, but more importantly, about the empathy that we all need. Welcome to the show, Hardy Brown. Thank you so much for having me, Nina. I'm really excited to be able to be here with you all today. And it was it was exciting meeting you with your group in Santa Barbara. Uh, I thought that we had some great conversations. It was really detailed and, and rich. And I learned as much as I shared, uh, but I learned so much from, from other people's stories. And I think that's really the, the idea of historical empathy is learning to walk in someone else's shoes, having those conversations, those real conversations that will bring us closer together. And so I think you you hit the nail on the head when you opened up with that. Well, I have to say, you know, it was a highly impactful uh, group. And one of the reasons why I wanted you on the show today is that I think your work in particular and your gift and how you present it is really needed in the world because there were all different cultures, all different backgrounds, and let's use it in more of the the extreme, black, white. And Mm -hmm. here was the thing that happened where there really was an empathetic understanding. And in this world in which we're saying, I'm right and you're wrong, and the divide, to have all cultures, not just black and white, come together in that space, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, if we can have it in that space, the microcosm of life, why can't we have it in the macrocosm? So I was like, I am so excited to have you on the show to share with us what you have, but also your teachings, because you said some really impactful things. And now I'm looking at your background there. And, you know, these aren't your Uh, artifacts, but what exactly is in the background that I'm seeing? So so I'm actually at my home office right now. And uh, my wife, one of the things that she wanted to do is make sure we had a really nice art wall. And so when we put together all of our art, uh, you can see a different piece that ties a lot of these pieces together. Uh, so over my shoulder, we have some pieces uh, from Ernie Barnes, who, who who was an artist after the NFL. Um, people would know him popularized through the show Good Times. Uh, but this is one of his pieces over here. Uh, wow. The piece with the tree is beautiful because that was done by kindergartners. Kindergarten. That was done by yeah, that was actually done by kindergartners and first graders at a school, and they were putting together all of their work. And within all of their work, they created this beautiful tree. And it kind of goes toward the idea of the tree of life, that they had all different designs, but all those different designs came together on one tree. That it, and Yeah. Right. And then over my shoulder on this side, uh, it's really cool because this is a piece that is the first normal school in America. And the first normal school is the first teaching college started in 1839. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as we kind of go through some of my pieces. But... Horace, Horace Manley, um, Horace Mann is the person who started this in 1839, and that led to many of the state colleges that we see even as of today. 
Wow. And I just find it so fascinating, the world of education and some of the things that you brought to light in our conference, but we get a chance to see today. So from your perspective, you know, you basically said that historical empathy is basically putting some yourself in somebody else's shoes. Is that what you would say yes. is is really what it is? And and yeah. where is the historical? Because historical is looking at looking back, obviously. So how does that fit into looking back at somebody else's shoes and what they went through? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. And that's and that's what I was going to say is the idea when we First, start looking at historical empathy. We were looking at the idea of empathy, empathy in the workplace, empathy in schools, empathy, having those conversations. But then as we started doing tours of the Underground Railroad and taking educators on these tours of the Underground Railroad, I realized that once we learn the stories of people in the past that had done so much with so little that it could inspire others the way that it inspired me. And the way that it inspired me was realize where there were people that looked differently, that came from different communities, that figured out a way to work together. And they changed history with little money, but with effort and, and grit and passion and a love for humanity. I love that. I, it's so needed. I'm so excited that you're doing this with our youth as well. You know, in this world of social media and quick fixes, we need to learn our history. So why don't you bring us through a little bit of what we got a taste of in our conference? Because I think, I mean, I have to tell you, you know, we got a chance to see it and touch it and feel it. In this case, if somebody's listening to this, I want you to go to the YouTube channel and watch it on the Life Bites YouTube channel. But if you're listening to this, you may not get the full effect. But but even with with me, you know, you know, seeing some of these artifacts that are just in some ways, I think, very sacred. I mean, there's a sacredness to these artifacts. I mean, they hold so much energy. But I think to give people a feel of these 20,000 plus artifacts that you already have, I think would be really, really interesting and fascinating for people. So I just like to make sure that everyone can see the screen. Um, what I decided to do was to pull out some of the presentation that I did uh, for your group so that people can see what it is they got a chance to experience that day. And the best way to really explain it is when we do our Underground Railroad tours, I come back with plenty of artifacts and I bring those artifacts. We go into community groups, schools, we talk to teachers, we talk to community leaders, and we have them go into our exhibits. And I ask them a simple question. In 200 years, somebody like me is gonna be collecting your historical artifacts, your yearbooks, we're going to be collecting uh, papers, newspaper clippings, all kinds of articles, works that you've done. How do you want history to remember you? How do you want history to remember you? And this goes back to each one of our presentations that we've done. And so these are some of the present, these are some of the comments from young people, from educators, from community leaders that have put that there. And then just for any of your people that are watching, they can actually click on any of the QR codes that they see at the top. Uh, they can wave that with their phone. It will automatically give them a download of some of the different pieces that goes through. Uh, but I always like to start with research. And so with Erkst and Young, they did a research last year on the idea of empathy in the workplace. So this is just not a school thing, but this is really understanding that in the state of the workplace, that having empathy, talking to different people, hearing their stories, it can grow to efficiency and creativity and innovation, and it can help us grow even as business leaders uh, in, in each one of our communities. Beautiful. I think this is so needed, you know, being in the HR field and people field of culture of, of companies. I think we've got to get out of still the divide, you know, uh, us versus them kind of feeling and inclusivity really does mean inclusivity of everybody, not just yeah. one race or two races, et cetera. So, yeah. So this is what our, our one of our exhibits looks like. Um, whenever we had this at the San Bernardino County Museum, we won a national award for this exhibit. It was one of their largest, one of their largest exhibits that came out. Uh, but we took about 150 primary source artifacts, some of them very, very tough to deal with. And we took them, brought them in so that students can see them in a really nice museum setting. Uh, we wanted them to have a curated piece, um, mm -hmm. newspapers that had dated back to the 1700s. And original copies of Uncle Tom's Cabin, pieces from the Civil War, and then just people who made a difference in that time period. And once they got a chance to go through, we would read the books to them. We would walk them through and let them put the gloves on and show them how this worked. And this became a really good place for our schools to be able to come and see the work that we did. 
And then, you know, we go out to the schools. So this is what it looks like when we go out to the schools. Everything is age appropriate. Uh, of course, when we're in the elementary schools, I'm only doing like piggy and elephant and I'm reading <laughs> that we are in a book. And I'm talking about how exciting it is to be in a book and that you can have fictional characters. You can have real people. You can take these stories and these biographies and learn. And it goes directly to California state standards when you're learning about biographies. Many students turn these projects into history day projects, but it goes all the way up through middle school, through high school, through college. And we just have great conversations based on the level that they are at. That's beautiful because everybody, ha you know, it, for little kids, they're very different than, you know, by the time you get to high school. Right. So this is. Very, oh, yeah. Yeah. Very. Fast. Oh, yeah. So for me, one of the things that I love um, is the idea of going back to where we started. So I try to understand like my path and understanding my path. Then I can help people help, help understand theirs. So this is where I went to college, Wilberforce University. And Wilberforce University, the book that's over my over my shoulder in the case over there, that's one of our one of our yearbooks from the 1930s. But Wilberforce University is the first college owned and operated by African Americans in the United States history. It was started by Dr. Daniel Payne and the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, back in 1856, so even before the Civil War. And these are some of the early students who went there. Um, but the same day that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, they burned our campus down to the ground. And he stood over those ashes, literally stood over them and said, from these ashes, a nobler building shall arise. And over 160 years later, that campus is still there educating that, students. That gives me chills. It gives me chills, you know, because- Isn't it something? It really is. And, and to, to make that declaration, you know, and I, I, what I found in looking back and looking through these artifacts is, you know, you said with very little money and very little resources, mm -hmm. that human spirit, when it has the passion, the drive and the knowingness, how much it can actually achieve. Right. I found that just so right. fascinating, you know, and it, it really does. I mean, through that understanding allows us to understand each other and not get into the blame game that we, we seem to be experiencing in this world of 20, you know, of, of the 21st century. <laughs> so. Well, it's, you know, when you think about current day, it's easy to go and just blame and blame and, and yell and scream. But I think when we have conversations, even if we disagree, because there's plenty of people I disagree with, um, politically, through, mm -hmm. through different means. But when I have a conversation and I listen to them and I ask them questions and I say, tell me about your upbringing and how did you get to where you are? And then I tell them my, my story. They can understand why I'm so passionate about HBCUs, historical black colleges and universities. They can understand why my passion for Wilberforce Force exists. I mean, look at some of the alum. When you think of movies like Hidden Figures, um, Dorothy, Dorothy Vaughn was played by Octavia Spencer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Banner Rustin, a person who worked directly with Martin Luther King in the March, March on Washington, he's a Wilberforceian. Uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, where there's plenty of schools named after him all across the country, he's from that area and received his honorary doctorate from there. And so when I think about where I am, I automatically go to the point and say, I walked on the hallowed grounds as some of these same exact people 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, which makes me research and try to understand even more of the story. I love it. It just, it really, and you know, the other thing before we move on here, I wanted to just share mm -hmm. something that I think was really powerful and I don't know how we can recreate it, but one of the things that came up and it was African-American lady in the group. And she said, this is the mm -hmm. first time that I'm feeling that there's a reverence for what my culture went through, what my race went mm -hmm. through 100, 200 years ago. And I think that I, I'll just speak from, you know, uh, being Croatian and a German descent, right? Categorized as a white white woman, right? In, in, in right. society is that a lot of times what I hear from, particularly from white people is, oh gosh, I, I don't want to be, labeled that. So just, let's just not talk about, it, let it go away. Right. Because there's not really right. a space in the room to have those feelings. And so one of the things that I thought was so powerful is that you gave a space for all of us to have our feelings without it being an attack or a negation of, and 
I don't know how we can recreate this, but I, I would like to see your work on magnitude of, because we certainly need it in the world today. We got to change this narrative hardy, <laughs> because it's. it's yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Sometimes I, I get afraid that, that we're no longer listening to each other um, with the, with, with so much communication tools that are out there. I, I fear that we're yelling and we're not listening. And the reason why she said she felt heard is because I was able to express the pain through the primary source artifacts, but then also say, but look at the inspiration of what they were able to do in spite of, or somebody made a mistake in their life, but look at what they were able to do, or someone was evil in their life, but here's where we remember them in history and how they and how they can, can be a part of history. And then again, my question to them at the end is, I'm not going to blame them, but I'm going to ask them for themselves for today. What do you want history to say about you? Because we can mess up. I mean, this is a perfect example of the slide that I have up. Perfect example of what we're talking about right now. This gentleman right here, his name is John Newton. John Newton, I think I said this at the, at the event, mm -hmm. but John Newton, this is 1752. He was a slave ship captain who goes from Liverpool, England, down to the Gold Coast of Africa, where he purchases over 250 enslaved Africans. If you go to a website like um, slavevoyages.com, you can actually see and download all the manifests of all the different ships. He does this trade multiple times. And during that time, he's going through all kinds of things. He does some of the worst things in history uh, to humanity. And he ends up writing letters to his wife and, and leaves the slave trade and then becomes a minister. And as he becomes a minister, he then turns around to write and change. And he becomes a part of the anti-slavery society, which then works together to, to change history. But John Newton, after leaving the slave trade, he then writes these letters to his wife. And basically, as a minister, he writes the song Amazing Grace. When I heard that, I was just so powerful. Mm. Yeah. And most people don't realize when you think about the, the words of Amazing Grace, um, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, you know, um, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I'm see. Saved. Actually, can we go back? Let me let me, let me go back. I need to go back because okay. I don't want to mess that up. Okay. Yeah. Go let me go back. Okay. So I'll, I'll do it right here. I'll do a good pause. Okay. And then I'll go into the next segment. Okay. So when you think about John Newton and what he did as a slave ship captain, he then turns around, becomes a minister, a writer, and he writes the song Amazing Grace. And when I'm usually on stage, I, I will sing it. So oh. it's amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And so 200 years later, we look at his story and we see the story of Amazing Grace. And we see the work that many of these abolitionists did to change the world working together. And that's where I gain a sense of this historical empathy, learning stories like this guy right here, his name is Granville Sharp. Many people won't know Granville Sharp, many histor historians will, but in 1771, Granville Sharp uh, is a is in Europe, and there's a man by the name of James Somerset who wants freedom, and he's in England, so I'm not even in America yet, but he's in England, and he wants freedom, and he was getting ready to be sold into slavery. Granville Sharp works with him. They partner together, and they fight a case. They take this case to Lord Mansfield, and that case in 1771 wins in England, where it says that if you, if you step foot on the grounds of England and you do not want to be enslaved, then you shall be free. Wow. And this case starts to become a catalyst to start to see all these other stories that you'll see that we'll go through and talk about. So here's one of the things that I think is really powerful, just to take a little pause here, is you're bringing up some white people, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think that's also setting the stage for we're in this together we stand, so to speak. Because what yeah. you said something very powerful about the right side of the history and the wrong side of history. T say that I don't want to mess it up the way that you said it. Yeah, so powerful. So, you so when, when you, yeah, when when you think about it, um, 
we're always arguing on the I, the ideas of it's black versus white, white versus black, brown versus black, black versus brown, men versus women. But it's really good people who choose to be on the right side of history. So good people who choose to be on the right side of history versus people, human beings who choose to be on the wrong side of history. And I want to put it in a context like that so that people can come to this conversation to the table and say, listen, I understand history was horrible. I understand that people that may have looked like me did some horrible things. But from this step forward, here's what I intend to do. This is what history, what I want to make in my family, in my legacy, in my community. I want to work in the schools. I want to work in my department. I want to work in my company. I want to lead these conversations so that we can become better in the future. And if we get to that point, then it becomes an easier conversation. When you look at this slide, together we stand in peace. Because exactly. you can find good people that look like each one of us. And then as I go through the next couple of slides, you'll see there's been some horrible things that people that may look like some of the people have done that are horrible. And in history, as I read their story now, I can say, wow, they did some horrible things. And I can go back and look at that and, and wonder, you know, what were they thinking during that time? Um, as, a, as an elected school board member, uh, one of the things that I always like to do is I would always have conversations about um, um, consequences that we didn't know were going to happen, unintended consequences. And I would talk to my, my board members and I'd say, hey, listen, if we're going to pass this piece, let's think about who is going to impact that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure that we're not doing something that's going to push one group out, but we're going to bring everybody together with, with all of our pieces. And, you know, I may have made some mistakes here and there, but my goal and my heart has always been pure in those pieces. Well, and let me just say this, because you're bringing up something really powerful. My intention and my heart was in the right place. We're human beings. All of us fall mm -hmm. down and go boom. Sometimes I say something and I don't think about how that might affect somebody else. Even in our transformational world, we had to look at the way that we were phrasing certain things as well. You don't want to be not, not even knowing that you are excluding somebody just by the nature. It doesn't even have to be, you know, race or ethnic background. It could be just people gathering together and you don't realize because you're becoming clickish that you're leaving somebody out it can be as as yes. as you know um not race related or culturally related as 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 well but your frame up to me is what's needed because this level of we're human we do all make mistakes you know black white green brown everything else in between right we're human beings, which mm -hmm. you said, we are more alike than different. If we can understand that, <laughs> we will start to work together instead of apart, right? And, and that's, the, that's the whole goal. So even on the side that the next slide that we look at, this law was intentionally done as the future. This is the future slave law of 1850. This is what creates California as a state. But as a part of this future slave law, what you can see is where it would impact people that look like me. But it would also impact other people throughout the United States, because if they saw somebody, they would be by law forced to grab me, ask for my papers, and then send me back into enslavement. For my family, this is life or death. For other people, yeah. it's a code of do I do it or don't I do it? And that's why I love collecting the law books, because the law books tell the true story. What I love to do when I collect these law books, so for example, this is from uh, this is from Virginia Code of Law, 18, 1860, so right after the Fugitive Slave Law. The laws are right there. But take a look at even how the, the words start to read. And then here's the impact of one of, our, one of our educators that went on our tour that stood where this law really worked. So this is one of our educators. Take a look at this. Okay. I'm, I'm, I was saying I'm not the emotional person at all, but I, found, I find myself not having the words to express how I'm feeling, it's here, I'm, I'm here. I'm here where it happened, where great people did some great things. And you read about it, but it's not the same. It's not the same as being here and touching this place. It is sacred ground, that's what I, it's sacred because of the people who were here. Um, and so looking across the river and, and uh, seeing what, where they were and coming back across the river and seeing, you know, their hope, this is where their hope was. And you know, I'm, I'm standing on the other side. Never experienced what they experienced, but it's deep. It, it's way deeper than I thought it would be, this experience. 
So when you look at Mel, for example, he's a physics teacher in one of our local school districts and where he's standing is on, on the Ohio River in Freedom in Ohio, but looking over into Kentucky where this exact spot right here is where Uncle Tom's Cabin took place. Wow. Uh, where it lies across the river, this is the exact spot. And that's why it's really impacting him. So imagine having the books, but then turning around and also having the experience of standing on some of those places. And so when you look at it this way, now you can see exactly what we're talking about. For people who chose to be on the wrong side of history, writing certain laws. This public policy, it says, every assemblage of Negroes for the purpose of religious worship, when such worship is conducted by a Negro, and every um, uh, assemblage of Negroes for the purpose of instructing in reading and writing in the nighttime is an unlawful assembly, punishable by stripes, oh. meaning lack in their back because they wanted to learn to read and write. Imagine if we took the word up Negro, and I said today, everybody who's watching this, this podcast, anybody who's wearing a pair of jeans, instead of the word Negro, this was you. Well, and I think we in have 18, to, 16. yeah, and I think we have to start to put ourselves in those sh the shoes of somebody else, because that is truly where we start to go, wow, you know, I don't know what that's like, just like a man doesn't know what it's like to be a female, let's say, in the workplace at times, you know, especially when I first started in the workplace, it's changed quite a bit. But, you know, I'll, I'll and I won't know what it's like to be a man. I won't know what it's like to be a Negro. I don't know that experience. But if I can have empathy and compassion for that other person's point of view. So my godson is African-American. I live here out here in the beach mm -hmm. cities of Los Angeles. And he went to a mainly all white high school. Okay. So he's mm -hmm. coming to visit me after school and he's got a sweatshirt on and it's the Maricosta high school sweatshirt. He looks like every other kid. Right. Except for he was getting out of his car and he's walking towards my house. And there was a, a couple walking down the street or up the street. And it's a, a white couple. And they crossed the street. Wow. He came into my house crying. Auntie Nina, yeah. I don't know what, what's going on. I, I I made them scared. I can feel it. And I just, you know, that feeling that I, I will never know what that's like, you know, I, I, I won't. And I, I think that if we can come from that compassionate viewpoint, then we can work together to bridge some of the stuff that is happening in the world today. And I loved what you just said about, you know, let's, let's take out the word Negro and put everybody with jeans. You know what I mean? And it's not yeah. so far off when people get scared, they get fearful. Yep. And and even what you said about, you know, um, for me and my family, that was life and death in terms of that law. For somebody else, they have to fight with themselves internally about, do I do, quote, the right thing or do I follow the law? And that's a scary and, decision and as well. Which takes us to the very next part of this, right? So thinking about your nephew and thinking about someone else who says, well, I'd be, I'd be, a, I'd be an abolitionist. I'd be a person who helped people to learn to read and write. This makes no sense. This is literally from the law of 1860. Yeah. So now look at this. I want to be on the right side of history and help somebody. The very next law, number 36, says if a white person, so a person not wearing jeans, a symbol with Negroes, a person wearing jeans, and teaches them to teach them to read and write, they will go to jail for six months and be fined $100. Wow. $100 in the 1860s today is thousands of dollars. So for every educator, every teacher who is out there looking at this and they're saying, well, I would be a person to teach them anyway, understand that they have to ask themselves the question, what kind of person am I? Who will I be? Will I be a person who chooses to be on the right side of history versus the wrong side of history? Many people go through and they say, well, you know, that's, but let's put it in context. Let's put it in context. Well, I go back and I read the original text right here next to me. I literally have it in my hand. This is the original book wow. of Frederick Douglass. Well, Frederick Douglass, his master's wife, is teaching him to read and write. The master walks in, slaps the book out of her hand and says, um, says, if you teach a slave to read and write, you will unfit them to be a slave. Frederick Douglass at that point knows the power of reading, the power of education, the power of words. And he starts to trade food for letters, letters for words, until he writes and gets to his freedom and writes some of the most iconic books of all time. Wow. And he puts this story in there as a part that is his as his catalyst that says, wow, education is powerful. Mm -hmm. And then I go through other stories like Miss Mary Peak. Miss Mary Peak was teaching formerly enslaved people to read. She was born free. 
in Virginia teaching formerly enslaved people to read underneath this tree right here. And underneath this tree is called, it's called Emancipation Oak because this is the first place the Emancipation Proclamation was read. Wow. This tree is still here today and it sits on the grounds of Hampton Institute, Hampton University in Virginia. That is another historically black college. Well, the guy on the top, his name is Booker T. Washington. After the Emancipation Proclamation happens, he walks off the plantation with the help of whites and blacks in the first four chapters of his book. He goes through and walks 500 miles to get to freedom. And when he goes to get to freedom, those 500 miles, what he's searching for is Hampton Institute because he wants to have an education. He gets all the way there, knocks on the door, goes to school there. And then after that, turns around with that same group of people and they purchase an old plantation in Tuskegee, Alabama. And they turn it into Tuskegee University, which is another historically black college, which is still open to this day, where you see so many people in history, in our history books today, that have attended a university. Wow. These wow. are the stories that I love to tell because these are the stories that will inspire people to understand, like, there were people who made history even in that time. You know, one of his major hires that he hired uh, was the first African-American to graduate from the University of Iowa. And, and the way I love to always tell the story to the students is he was he was a scientist. He loved, he loved outdoors. He loved plants. But he also loved peanuts, George Washington mm -hmm. Carver. He went to go work and spent the rest of his career working at Tuskegee University. And so yeah, these are the things that really tie our stories together. And then when we do our tour, this is one of the houses that gentleman, Mel, that was talking about the river earlier. Yeah. He was at the bottom of the river here. This house belonged to Reverend John Rankin. And over 2,000 people would start off crossing that river and make it all the way up the hill, running from slave catchers and hiding. And the best way we know the story is Eliza from Uncle Tom's Cabin. This is the exact spot where she would have run to hide. And as a part of our Underground Railroad tour, every single year, we, we help educators run up this hill, get a chance to see what it was like, run an actual Underground Railroad. And this group, Blacks and whites in this town of Ripley, Ohio, Brown County, Ohio, they figured out a way to be on the right side of history, even during the time of enslavement, even during a time of the fugitive slave law, even of a time when it was illegal for people to read and write and teach people to read and write. They chose to be on the right side of history. I love So it becomes it becomes real. Yeah, it really yeah, does we, become real. I mean, even seeing this, you know, it's one thing in person, but it's even it's even more fascinating right now. Like if on the screen, you know, you have a ch chance to kind of digest what you're saying and and having these visuals and having the law. Right. It's not what I think happened. This was actually what was happening during that day, right. you know, in that time. Right. Uh, yeah, and I have I literally, I literally have the book right here sitting next to me. Virginia Code of Law. This newspaper right here. This newspaper is from Kentucky Reporter, 1820. I opened it up. So now I'm getting into my, my wonky, I love to collect space. But <laughs> I opened it up to the back page and I found this article. $200 reward, ran away from subscriber, living in or near Kentucky area, maybe Ohio, a Negro man by the name of Hardy. Wow. Yellow complexion, my height, everything. Oh my God. And he runs away with his sister, Amy Jordan, my daughter's name is Jordan. And this and is so, random that you found? Yeah. Yeah. I found this in wow. one, of our, one of my newspapers in my collection. And so I started to see this connection. And that's when we talk about the idea of historical empathy. That's when you start to see this thing is more real than more people would ever realize. Um, this, this is on our tour. I'm standing on the grounds of where the Niagara movement happened. This is where W.E.B. Du Bois where they came together and they started to put together uh, the beginnings of the NAACP. So that's the Niagara River, and this is the park where they met. And one of the things that people don't realize when we talk about history is we get caught into our snippets. So our TikTok, our Twitter, our Instagram, which is just the picture and the little quote, and that's it. Well, look at what they were actually asking for. In their declaration of principles in 1905, they were asking for common schools to educate all students. They were asking for equality in education for all students, regardless of race. When you think about the reconstruction centers and what they put together, that's what how that's how we developed our common school system that is public schools today. It was set up so that all people could go to school. And we only hear our little snippets, our little 
pieces that we want to hear. But if we start to go through and read all these pieces, we would see that each artifact tells a real story. Each artifact tells a story. I love things from the Civil War. So this rifle is from the Massachusetts 54th, which is the colored troops. Uh, anybody watching, if you've ever seen the movie Glory and the people who stormed up the hill, this wow. is from one of the people from the movie Glory, but one from one of the real people. Uh, and he was a descendant that escaped from Kentucky, made it to freedom to Ohio. Hardy, and then hold I on. Until Hardy, yeah. hold on one second. We're going to, yes. oh my gosh, I cannot believe it. So, oops, let me go back. So this slide right here, one of the things I love to do is I love to tell the story about this rifle and this flag. Um, but these are just some of the pieces that deal with the Civil War. So the rifle belonged to um, Addison, Addison White. Addison White escaped from slavery, becomes a person who makes it free on the Underground Railroad. And then years later, he ends up working and getting recruited to be a part of the Massachusetts 54th, where he fights with the colored troops in the Civil War uh, that changes the tide of the Civil War. And so this is his rifle from that. Uh, anybody watching, if you've ever seen the movie Glory, these are the people that would have been a part of the movie Glory who stormed that final hill. These would have been some of those same exact people. Uh, and then that flag, that flag belonged to General Ricketts. General Ricketts is a general in the Civil War. He gets captured and his wife, his wife Fanny, sees that her husband is captured and goes in and talks to the Confederate soldiers and says, hey, can I save my husband? I'm a nurse. They let her save her husband and many other soldiers. And then she notices that the, the Confederate soldiers shot down the American flag. They ripped it up in, into shreds. They threw it down. She takes her bonnet and in her diary, I have a piece of her diary right there, but in her diary, she takes it, folds it up, hides it into her hat, into her bonnet, and passes it down generation to generation to generation until it finally made its way into our collection from a very generous donor. But this piece right here, that flag is the very last flag to fly over America before the Confederate soldiers took over. Wow. And so it is so a powerful, powerful piece when you see these stories and there's like a thousand stories just on this one page so i always ask the question in 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 your space what was that experience to inspire you you know when we tell me about your story and what inspired you to do the work that you do especially in hr i think you know it's interesting i think we we are born with certain purposes and passions some people have to look and search for them and sometimes if i think if you tune in you realize that your passion and purpose is all around you so for me mm -hmm. it was transformation i've been you know i have little um notes from when we were in grammar school and i have friends from when i was in grammar school and one of the things that we were writing notes back and forth and one of the my friends to this day is still a friend of mine said nina you're such a good listener you should be a counselor right well i'm in the transformational mm -hmm. space so whether it's hr in terms of coaching and training and people operations or life in you know helping people transform their space when i was in media 18 years old i'm telling people to believe themselves and i was a radio disc jockey at the time music disc jockey i'm thinking where did that come oh, from wow. i had no idea so you know i think that it was, it kind of found me and it was really interesting because I'm seeing that in you. It's kind of like you might've started out as an educator, but how did you get to really plug into this? Because this certainly lights you up and it's certainly needed in the world right now because we need to have and understand history because a lot of history is being erased too. The, you know, we're trying to yes. put nice little bells and whistles on history and it's like, no, this stuff really happened here. Let's get, let's get to the truth. Not it, and, that's, and that's what I say every time. I'm like, listen, for example, this letter right here from 1959, this is a real letter where a person who made it and was qualified to get into school could not go to school because of their race. But then you also see at that same exact time, Betty White, who we all know and love. Her show gets canceled because she says, I'm going to have a black man on my TV show on TV. I don't care what you say. And they tell her, don't do it, Miss Betty White. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I'm going to be on the right side of history. And she does it anyway. And look at how we look at her life. Who we see is Betty White and the work that she did being on the right side of history, even during that time. So again, just like I asked you the question, so I'm doing this in practice so that people, your listeners can see how to do it. Wow. You Go know, have conversations so powerful. With people. it's so, so powerful. And how did you get inspired to do this work? I'm making assumptions here, but how did you make, mm -hmm. how did you get inspired to do this? 
Well, I, I kind of grew up in a family in a community here in, in San Bernardino, California, where we we were all kind of thrown in together. And, you know, when you're thrown in together, you start having these conversations. And I grew up with my dad. He helped to desegregate schools in our city. My mother was ex- elected to the California Assembly. Um, we have a family that's been around politics and education for our entire life. We've been a part of the press and the media. We've owned a newspaper, but now for 50 years. And, and so I grew up with every community and having these conversations. And it never made me feel any kind of way to to shed the light on somebody else's story. So for example, before I went to the first tour of our Underground Railroad tour one year, I went over to the Holocaust Museum and I had a conversation with these two young ladies. (laughs) And I asked them, I said, what was it like to go through the Holocaust? And what does it mean when you say, no one will ever forget? And they would explain it to me and I said, wow. And then I realized there were things that I did not know. So when I was elected, I did not really understand what the Day of the Dead was. Yeah, And I would see students with their faces made up and I'd see them going to the cemetery. And then I realized the same way that we would honor our ancestors, the same way we would do some of these pieces in the Black community, what they were doing was honoring their ancestors. Mm-hmm. When I saw the movie Coco, it really came to me and I was like, oh, I got it now. That makes total <laughs> sense. But you know, uh, that, that, that's so powerful. Go back and honor your ancestors. Yeah, I mean, but this is so powerful. It's it, it. There's a natural curiosity that you have. And I think you said it at the very beginning. I got curious. I get curious and ask people questions if I don't agree with them. And we've lost that muscle within ourselves yeah. to get excited about, wow, you think differently than me. I mean, it, it's now become wrong if we think differently. And I think it's what thinking different allows innovation to happen. It allows us to have these yes. conversations, allow us to, you know, kind of reach across the aisle if you want to talk politics, right? And and talk about, you know, the things that bring us together. Because I agree, there's more things that we have that regardless of what your politics are, your culture is, we want to be loved and accepted and we want to be understood, right? right? In really every powerful. community. Yeah. In every community, you see the same exact things. So I'll kind of start to wind it down right here because I know the podcast will go on for like six hours <laughs> if you let me keep on talking. I know. Uh, but this is one of my Harper's Weeklies from, 19, from 1867. But look at this. Colored scholars learning in the streets. Wow. Look at the way they wrote that in 1867. And then go back to the pandemic today and look at the same exact article. Students went in education so bad that they went Mm -hmm. to to Taco Bell and they sat there and used Wi-Fi so that they could learn. Wow. So for me, when you talk about the curiosity, it's having conversations with different people, but then it's having conversations with people like my parents. This is where my family was enslaved in Jones County, North Carolina. This dates back to my father, me, my father, oh. my grandfather, my great grandfather. How powerful. and just five generations later, say again. I said this is powerful, you know, because you talk Thank a you. lot Thank about you. the legacy and the, you know, the history and where, you know, two hundred years from now, people will be talking. You'll be in those pictures, and other people will be talking about you and your life and the thing that and the way that you've made a difference and you've kept the history of not only, you know, everybody else in terms of history, and we should all know about this, but your own family. And I think that's really powerful to see, you know, where you came from. Yeah. Most people, they don't have have questions and conversations with their parents. Something I learned over over the exhibit, um, over the pandemic during this time period, was to start to interview my parents. You know, and and I I started to put them on tape and have these conversations. And when I put them on tape, I was like, oh, my goodness, I learned so many stories that I didn't know about my dad, about my mom, them growing up in in these areas, about my grandparents and my great grandparents. uh, And I didn't realize it. And so it helped me to grow as a person. And these are tips that I can give to your listeners to say, hey, think about just going to grab your phone, put on the microphone portion of it or video and go talk to the oldest living person in your family and ask them questions. What was it like? How did you get here coming through Ellis Island? Oh, yeah. How did you get here and become a citizen of the United States? How did you get here through the Great Migration and become free? How did you do all these things and become who you are? That's kind of the conversation and how we get to that point. And, you know, every day I love to grow from it. And every day I realize that we as citizens 
as human beings, citizens of the world, we have an obligation to each other. And that obligation is to learn from each other, grow from, from each other, and, and take the things that we've done, good and bad, and just keep on pushing forward. Um, but it's going to take each one of us. That little town of Ripley, Ohio, it really inspires me. Because at a time when those same laws that said the fugitive slave law said that any person would have to grab a person, pull them into slavery, no matter what, and, and, and put them back into this system, there were people who said no. And then at a time when someone who made it on the Underground Railroad made it all the way to Canada, and they realized that they had left some of their brothers and sisters behind, so they put the uniform on and said, I want to fight for freedom, not just for myself, but for so many other people. So uh, each one of these pieces tell a story. That's where our educators are today because they're fighting for our kids. That's where our parents are because they want the best for their kids. That's where our businesses can be because they want to offer jobs and careers for our next generation. We just have to have these conversations so that we can continue to grow and not be as afraid as we've been over the last couple of years. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And so brilliantly said because I think the world right now needs these conversations we need to get curious even if you think you're right you know yeah. I, you know let's let's get curious because when you present the way that you did you bring everybody to the conversation and you're not excluding a race or a culture you're saying hey the right side of the history and the wrong side of history you know and I know when I'm doing something that isn't right. And sometimes legally doesn't mean morally right. And it's hard and difficult when there's fear to stand up for what you think is right. And I love what you say is, how do you want to be remembered 200 years from now? What do you want your legacy to be? Uh, let me ask you just a couple more questions before we finish up today. Yeah. What do you think the answer is? Because you're one person here. Um, we're we're in a pretty strong state, uh, not just on a racial uh, stand front, but on a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a political one. We've stopped talking to each other, even on a science basis. You know, it's this I'm yeah. right, you're wrong. You know, those people, those people. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay, wait a minute here. I thought we were all, and I, you know, this is my own belief system. We're having, a, you know, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, not the other way around. And if you look at all of our DNA, we're really quite close to each other. So it's just basically the color of my skin, so to speak, right? right. So, yeah. so what do you think the answer is right now? First of all, I wish I was smart enough to know. I, I wish I was smart enough to know. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. I, I wish I was smart enough to know the answer. Um, but I can tell you this: from my experience in my community here, um, we have people who start to have conversations um, across party line, across racial line, across community line, and we've had these at our county. We started having these strategic planning committee conversations, and those conversations we're building a network of all of us. How are we gonna move our county together, better together? And we started working together on different projects and we would do we would do our LCAP, so which is our local control uh, of funding for schools. We would do how we're gonna bring businesses into the area. We would do how we're gonna look at health, how we're gonna look at climate change, how we're gonna look at you know the, the freeways that are coming in. Because when I grew up, we actually had a huge amount of smog that would come through this area and they've been able to clean it up. Many people know our area because of the, the big snow that just happened or the mm -hmm. fires that happened in our area. And so our community had to come together. And so I don't know the answer to how we're gonna fix it nationally. There's people who are doing this from think tanks that are brilliant, that study this stuff all the time. All I can say, is that we have to do it and we have to take on and look at what people have done in the past and realize they did it with nothing. They figured out a way in Ripley, Ohio for blacks and whites to come together, to create businesses to come together, to create underground railroads to come together, to write and publish even at that time when they were saying that you could not do it, they figured out a way to do it. We can take the history of it and we can say, if they could do it, then we could do this as well. And to me, that's one of the biggest pieces right there is, is having those conversations. You know, it's funny. I'm going to bring somebody in 
to this. I'm going to just have him poke his head okay. in. Ronnie, come over here, poke, poke your head in real quick. Uh, yeah. Because I'm, I'm on a podcast where we're talking about historical empathy and coming together in the conversation of this particular thing. So hey, this, everybody. so this Hi. is one of my good friends. <laughs> he works for, he, so he works for uh, Riverside County Office of Education, and he had me come out and speak just recently to a number of educators. So he was dropping some pieces off to, to me here. But we we're talking about our underground railroad. We're talking yeah. about having conversations with people who don't look like you, yeah. uh, having conversations and just learning and growing. And I was just saying as you walked in, you know what it was like for our organizations in our community to come together. And look at education from the Inland Empire standpoint, you know, uh, if you wanted to, yeah, this no. Nina, by the way. Oh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> I love hi, it. Nina, I love it. Well, it's powerful. So, yeah, Hardy and I go way back, uh, way back to San Bernardino City uh, is where I met him and his lovely daughter, Jordan. So, uh, yeah, just very powerful work uh, that, that Hardy does in his organization and uh, just the historical significance of all the things that all the artifacts he brings and the story he tells behind them uh it's just very powerful uh everywhere that hardy's been that i go uh you just feel a sense of history uh it really brings people together uh people that don't look like each other uh really does uh develop em empathy and builds that uh especially if if uh, people get a chance to go on the trip the underground railroad tip trip it's just uh it's life-changing like anybody who's done it they'll tell you that so. How often do you guys? And do by the way, I didn't plan him here to do I that. Know, I just but walked I, in. But, it, but, <laughs> but you, you, you know, I had the same experience with you. That's why he's here today. Thank you so much for being here too. I mean, seriously, it's yeah. just such a powerful uh, reason right now. This conversation and being the bridger uh, that that to me is when we have space and containers to have these conversations. It is inclusive just by the nature of who you are and the narrative that you bring. And it it inspires all of us. It's inspired, I could tell, your, your colleague here. It certainly inspired me. And I'm hoping that it will inspire our audience to start shifting the conversation from I'm right and you're wrong to, hmm find out more about what you think and how you feel that way. And let's start to have more conversations around topics that are not always so easy to have, but without the judgment, I think that will go a long, long way. And I want to help people uh, get to either going to the underground uh, railroads in Ohio. How often do you have this tour? We do this every year. So that was a great example right there of Dr. Henderson coming over uh, and dropping off a piece from a, a piece from my collection. Uh, when you have conversations with people who don't look like you, you can learn and grow. And I've learned so much from his story, and he's learned so much from my story. So you could actually see it in real time. I did not plan that. He was just a person who just texted me and said, "Hey, can I drop something off?" And it was at the perfect point of our conversation. I want to give you two more two more quick slides that kind of give us on the positive side of what I get a chance to do. Uh, Many people drive by cemeteries on a regular basis and they look at things and say, Ugh, I don't want to go in there. Um, but I was at an event and I was talking to a young lady and she ends up handing me this book that's in this slide right here. And I finally opened up this and it's the 1891 through 1896 tax and property deed taxes for San Bernardino County. It wow. dates back to different people who were the pioneers of our, of our community. And so when I was going through, I found a name the name Elizabeth Lizzie Rowan. And I remember hearing her name before because she's one of the pioneers of our city and of our county and our region. Well, Lizzie Rowan was born enslaved as a little girl. The same way my family was enslaved on that plantation, she was enslaved and given as a gift to a couple. This couple brings her across the Oregon Trail from Utah all the way from the Carolinas to Utah, all the way down into San Bernardino. They were brought in with 26 enslaved African people who came here to our community. The fugitive slave law happens, that, that compromise that I was talking about. California becomes a free state, so there's no longer slavery in our state. But many of the people who were here stayed here in that area. As a free woman now, after 1850, Miss Lizzie Rowan now has built a life She's been married to a gentleman named Charles. They own a home and a business downtown San Bernardino. And this is her burial site 
uh, right here in downtown San Bernardino. But what's really significant about her story is she was born enslaved and died free. Business owner, landowner, and doing amazing things. But get this, the story gets better. Wow. Because this is her daughter, Alice. Alice becomes in the 18, in the 18, in the 1800s, becomes one of the first African-Americans to graduate from Poly High School here in the local area. Then she goes off to the state normal school at Southern California. Many people are going to ask you, ask themselves, what is the normal school? <laughs> exactly. The normal school is that picture that was over my shoulder. That is the first normal school where we created teachers colleges. In Southern California, we had that particular one. In Northern California, it would be like San Jose State, Chico State, or in Southern California, San Diego State. But this one, in 1888, she becomes <laughs> the first African-American to graduate from UCLA once oh, wow. they change its name from the normal school, becoming one of the first African-Americans to teach all white students in the state of California. Powerful. And Miss Alice Rome goes on to make history. That's the power of education. It's a power of Daniel Payne starting Wilberforce University, where I went to college, and then them starting the normal schools where teachers could then go on and create this new crop of and generation of scholars that are going to change the world. So for me, every single day, I get inspired by people who use education to inspire others and those like Frederick Douglass, who taught himself to learn to read and write. Or somebody like Booker T. Washington, who walks 500 miles with the help of whites and blacks, and he gets to the doors of a historically black college, Hampton Institute, and he says, I want an education. And then he turns around and creates all the things that he created. Understanding that, if we took your story from how your family came here, that's how we grow. If we took my family story or Ronnie's family story and learned those stories and then said, what's that thread that pulls us all together, that humanity that growth together, that's historical empathy. Powerful, powerful. Hardy Brown, I don't even have to ask you what inspires you. You are a walking, living, breathing inspiration. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, I am Nina Boski for Life Bites and Life Inspired. Remember, until next time, Take a bite out of life before life takes a bite.